Good evening, uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on which part of the world you're in. And my name's Gavin Dykes and I'm pleased to be chairing this Education Fast Forward 17th debate. It's on innovation and quality, two sides of the same coin. And we're doing this in partnership with UNESCO and UNESCO's Mobile Learning Week. UNESCO's Mobile Learning Week is about innovating for quality and it has three sub-themes. Sub Those three sub-themes are making high quality education a reality for all learners, improving pedagogy and the relevance of learning, and enhancing management planning and evaluation. So in a sense, that's like access to me, like access quality and organization when it comes to the use of mobile technology and learning. So we have an exciting week ahead as part of UNESCO's Mobile Learning Week. We are, uh, lots of people are listening in, I hope, to our video stream. And those listening into the video stream and also those who are coming in by way of video conference, I hope you will be tweeting as we go. And the tweeting should contain the hashtag EFF17, or, or perhaps and, uh, hashtag MLW 2016. So that's EFF 17 for Education Fast Forward 17 and MLW for Mobile Learning Week 2016. It's going to be an exciting debate, I think, not least because we have, I believe, 26 locations connecting to us here with contributors from those 26 locations and 31 debaters overall. Uh, so what we need is a context and a frame for, for our discussion coming up. And for that, I'm very pleased to welcome Mike Sharples, who's Professor, professor of Education Technology at The Open University. Mike, can you set us up, please? Thank you, Gavin. Uh, I'm delighted to be joining uh, this debate and to be starting it off. It seems like it's an exciting time to be engaged in education generally, but mobile learning in particular. There's a massive change underway in education and mobile learning is at the center of it. I've only got time to give one example. Uh, English in Action, developed by the Open University and the BBC, is already reaching seven million people in Bangladesh who use just standard mobile phones to improve their English. They get three minute audio lessons at very cheap affordable rates. But equally important, English in Action is involving over 20,000 teachers in Bangladesh and one million school students through media classroom teaching materials developed and delivered for low cost SD cards to teachers mobile phones. And this project has been rigorously evaluated and it shows positive learning gains. So when people say to you that mobile learning doesn't work, or that it just disrupts the classroom, or it hasn't been evaluated, just reply English in action. And the reason that project is a success is it, it's an integrated program involving personal mobile devices, teachers' mobile phones, and based on a sound pedagogy of active constructivist learning. And having pedagogy-led rather than technology-led innovation is essential for success. But that's literally half a world away from the battleground of many schools, where children bring their mobile phones into classrooms and then teachers ban them. And that problem's entirely of schools' own making. In some countries, notably Denmark, mobile devices in schools just isn't you. Children bring them in, they use them where appropriate to carry out projects, browse websites, support their learning. Nor is it an issue in higher education. It's just in some countries and some schools that perhaps have fetishized mobile technology. So I would say get over it and move on. Accept that we live in a mobile connected world. Explore how mobile devices can connect learning at home and at school. How handheld devices can enable small group learning. How we can harness mobile phones as scientific toolkits. And most of all, how we can spread best practice among teachers and policymakers. I hope this discussion 
will focus on appropriate pedagogy for mobile devices in education and how to extend projects like English in Action to other countries and other subject areas and in particular how we evaluate effectiveness and spread success. So I'm looking forward to this debate uh, and to hearing everybody's views and, uh, and to contributing later on. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much. That, that's a brilliant, uh, a brilliant opener for us. And I think drawing on the innovation and quality, two sides of the same coin, very neatly indeed. So with that, I'd like to go to our next speaker. And I need to double check that our next speaker is indeed there. Uh, our next speaker should be Professor Maria Soldad Ramirez Montoya from the Tecnologico de Monterrey in Mexico, but who happens to be speaking to us from Madrid. Um, I hope, speaking to us from Madrid, uh, Maria. Hello. I think that's. A I don't know oh, if good. you can me. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Over to you, Maria. Would you like to give us your presentation? Thank you so much. I uh, I be looking for my response to share my presentation because my connection is very very uh, few here in my hotel, and I need your help. Sorry. Right, Maria. I think right. what we're going to do. Do and Andrew, please advise me uh, if this connection uh, cannot be resolved. We will go to the next speaker first. Andrew, can you? Andrew. Yeah, I think it might be better, Gavin. Uh, I think Maria's had some issues with the wireless bandwidth uh, the location where she is, so okay. we'll work on that right now. And if you can move to the next one, that'd be great. I'll come back to you. So, with that, um. I'd like to thank Maria for her presentation, but sadly, that's probably a little bit presumptuous because hopefully we'll catch you later. And I hope you're ready and waiting, Thomas. Um, so we have Associate Professor Thomas Phillip, who's from the University of California in Los Angeles, and who is going to take the discussion forward, I hope. Thomas. Hello, everyone. Over to you. <laughs> Hi. Perfect. Um, So I'd like to begin by, um, for one, just uh, expressing gratitude uh, to have the space facilitated. I think it's a really important conversation. Um, it, it raises a lot of challenges and tensions and contradictions that um, end up emerging in the space of mobile technologies in schools and, and in learning spaces. Um, so, so thank you for, for bringing this space together. So first of all, I'd like to begin by emphasizing the importance of place and context when thinking about teaching and learning. It is important that we don't fall into a trap that assumes that mobile technology will lead to a utopian learning context where students are freed from all the limitations of, and constraints of traditional brick and mortar schooling. We need to clearly articulate when, in what contexts, and how specifically mobile technologies can support particular types of learning. So returning to the importance of place and context, my remarks here are based primarily on my experience working in high schools throughout the Los Angeles area over the last five years. So a key component of our research project was to have students use mobile technologies to collect data about themselves and about issues that are important to them. So the collection and analysis of personally relevant data was intended to promote computational and statistical thinking particularly within the context of an introductory computer science course and an introductory data science course. Um, so we, we undoubtedly experienced powerful moments of learning. And, and I think these moments of learning were, were made evident when students engaged with their own data in ways that would not be possible without mobile technologies. So for instance, um, students were collecting data about um, about billboards in their in their neighborhoods but when they when they use mobile technologies to take a picture of, of billboards they would automatically be geotagged and they could visualize uh, this data on um, on google maps very uh, very seamlessly so when they were able to do this part of what came up with this was this conversation around privacy 
right? And what it means in a in the digital age for for us to inadvertently give up our privacy in terms of location in a, in a number of different spheres. So it prompted this beautiful conversation around democracy, privacy, and and data science and computational thinking. Um, but given given these powerful moments of learning, I'm also going to express some reservations here. And I'm going to uh, express these reservations with the hope that sharing some of our experiences and cautions can contribute to our dialogue today and expand, uh, expand the conversation and hopefully build upon um, a deeper understanding um, around the pedagogy of, uh, of mobile technologies. So we face three top level challenges. First, a lot of instructional time was squandered dealing with the technology issues. So get, getting the technology to work, particularly in a large classroom with a single teacher, and with technology that wasn't always up to date or consistent across classrooms, took much longer than anticipated. Second, the novelty effect of mobile phones quickly waned. The motivating idea was that mobile phones would allow students to collect and analyze their own data. The use of phones was initially novel, but it soon got repetitive and lost its allure. In fact, many of the students eventually resented having to complete assignments that required smartphones. Third, the app and the corresponding front end were not responsive to students' developing interests. A great deal of work went into creating apps and other infrastructure. Our app and front end were meant to be adaptive, but students started asking questions that couldn't be adequately answered with our platform. Given the large investment in time and resources, there was a pressure to continue to use the technology. With some irony, the platform that was supposed to give students flexibility constrained their learning. One of the biggest challenges that I've witnessed is that mobile technologies are conceived outside of the constraints of schooling. And again, um, my, my words of caution here are coming from the use of mobile technologies in traditional classrooms or, or tr traditional uh, brick and mortar schools. The biggest lesson that we've learned as a project time and again over the last five years is that mobile technologies must be incorporated into learning contexts in a manner that honors teachers' professionalism and students' desires and goals. When mobile technologies are one set of tools in a repertoire of resources that a teacher has access to, they can be leveraged in powerful ways. As we've written about, mobile technologies should be considered in light of the text, the tools, and the talk that they make available for teaching and learning. The work of the teacher is essential to create sustained, deep trajectories of learning, particularly in school environments. Mobile learning is successful when the pedagogy is effective. We must invest in supporting the growth of teachers who are able to closely consider the pros and cons of mobile technologies in their specific context and leverage them, or perhaps not leverage them accordingly. In terms of students, we've seen that, the adult, um, that adults assume that young people's out-of-school interests are going to fluidly transfer into school-based learning. What we've documented instead is that the novelty effect wears off and students often resent that their interests are co-opted and appropriated into the curriculum. For instance, in many of the classrooms we observed, students began to see the mobile phone that they used for school as a burden. They were more than happy to Instagram a picture of a particular delicious meal, but were annoyed when teachers asked them to document their snacks with smartphones for data analysis. In a particularly striking case, Students were resentful that a program that expended financial resources on mobile technologies was being implemented while band and music were being cut at their schools. For mobile technologies to successfully support teaching and learning, they must develop in close conversation with teachers and students. We also encountered a few major issues when thinking about scaling up the use of mobile, school, mobile phones in schools. First, who will provide the technology? If schools provide them, how do we address issues of liability? What if parents are unwilling or unable to assume some of the liability? If the assumption is that students use their own devices, what expect expectations arise for students to purchase and possess up-to-date 
compatible devices. Similar challenges emerge in terms of data plans and the life of devices. Second, a recurring issue that came up in our work was that students felt that they lacked freedom with, with mobile technologies in schools. Schools are often required to limit access to websites, social networking sites, and modes of digital communication. But these limits change the very meaning of digital technologies for students and inadvertently discourage their instructional usage as intended by adults. Third, as students use mobile technology, technologies, they generate heaps of data, both consciously and more often without explicit consideration or awareness. Such data on one hand can be powerful. Those data can be used to presumably customize learning experiences for students. But we run the risk of limiting the possibilities of learning through dynamics analogous to the filter bubble. I would like to close with a few words about the relationship between mobile technologies and equity. If classrooms, schools, and society are inequitable, the introduction of mobile technologies into classroom spaces will not fundamentally alter these inequities. We need to engage in the difficult work of understanding and addressing relationships of power, authority, and knowledge in the classroom. We must create learning environments where students and their cultural backgrounds are valued and built upon. We need spaces where students feel connected to their peers and adults. If we create these conditions, mobile technologies can benefit all students. Otherwise, as history has shown us, the introduction of new technologies in classrooms will continue, for the most part, to reproduce existing patterns of success and failure. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Excellent. Um, I, just one question that uh, comes to my mind as, as you were speaking there. Um, and I'm glad to see you've got coffee. They've got more food than you in, in, in Egypt, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you mentioned students asking questions that couldn't be answered adequately by the platform. Could you just unpack that just for a moment? Sure. Um, so again, I think this is one of the, the challenges that at least emerged in our space, because a lot of time went into uh, creating the app and the infrastructure for data analysis on the front end. Um, so students were collecting data, in this case, about their eating habits. And what we were hoping to create was a space uh, for students to then analyze data around um, what they eat, what their peers eat, and how that compares to um, data collected by the Center for Disease Control and national data sets around, around youth and eating habits. But what happened was um, students had collected, um, uh, collected information about their own eating habits, but as they started pursuing their questions, most of the questions related to um, issues around motivation, issues around why people make certain choices, and none of these questions could be answered with the data that they had collected. Um, so it would, so ideally what would have happened would be the new set of questions would have set up the space uh, to ask a new set of, um, to engage in a new inquiry. And, and again, being very student driven to inquire into why people make, this, make the choices that they make um, and what are the systemic contexts in which those choices are made. But unfortunately, there was such a pressure to continue using um, the technology uh, that was developed that most of these questions were sidelined. And um, so it was, a, it was a choice, like, do we continue using the technology or do we really authentically um, engage students', uh, students interests and their inquiries? And so, it, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's essentially, no, in some ways, the technology ended up limiting that space of inquiry. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks, thanks, Thomas, for that. I, I, and since we've talked a lot about students, I'd like to bring in Manon I, from Belgium. Manon, are you able to hear us? Yes, I am. Would Would you like to comment on that? And and just are your comments in general about the use of mobile learning and what it can bring, and perhaps something about the 
the relationship, the power relationship, as it was just called, between uh, a teacher and student, and who's leading learning in a way. Well, um, at school, since a few months, we've got smart school, and so we can send a message to our teachers if we have a question and because we are just started it's not a lot of questions and we can also um, look at the powerpoints from our lessons if we got a test or something like that and we don't understand it that's excellent and is are you um are you using your own phone or are you using phones provided by the school? It's uh, my own phone that I use. And and tell me, uh, how does this compare to your normal use of your own phone? Because I imagine you do a lot of that with your colleagues and learning from from fellow students and engage and learning in different ways. So I'm wondering how the school learning fits, or your use of the technology for school learning is different or the same as learning with your friends. Well, um, every one of my class has Facebook and we've got a class chat. Also, if we don't understand something or we've been sick and we have to use notes from somebody else, we, um, we look what we can find there and we ask on, um, other classmates. That's, that's excellent, Manon, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for joining us. I know it's um, late-ish for you. <laughs> But I'm really glad you're here and contributing. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to jump, if now, to um, to Egypt and to Tarek, if um, you're with us, Tarek, and just to uh, uh, yes, kind of yes. put put what's been said in the context of what you're seeking to do in Egypt. Well, thanks, Gavin, and I wish we could uh, host you to the pastries we have here in Cairo, but we can't do that through Polycom. But give, uh, give me ten minutes. Uh, it was very, very. <laughs> <laughs> it's very exciting to listen to the previous speakers, especially that we are embarking on two or three uh, very exciting projects here in Egypt. Uh, we have a, a national vision to rebuild or reimagine the Egyptian education system from the ground up. And that's an opportunity that doesn't happen very often. This is where we are gonna put all these ideas together, including what is being debated now on mobile learning. But, but there is another project that is now running, it's on the ground, where we try to um, activate the concepts of knowledge societies and learning societies. We have what we call the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. Now that's, one of the largest digital libraries in the world. This is the accumulation of content from publishers, from curriculum developers, from digital content everywhere in one place. The big thing is this is done with open access to the entire population. So we have the top quality material from publishers like Springer Verlag, Elsevier, Wiley, Pearson, Discovery, National Geographic, all wrapped up in one place that is accessible to every child, every adult in the country, and not just to researchers in universities. The, the key idea is this is all digital content. For access to it, people have to use mobile devices like smartphones, tablets, uh, desktops, and the likes. Now, we were surprised to have 8 million hits in the first 24 hours, which shows that people have this appetite to access digital content. We are working on the analytics of that site and trying to figure out, learn from this experience on mobile access, on limitations and things like that. 
We are also working with the Ministry of Education to update our curricula from 7th to 12th grades by connecting each lesson to the Knowledge Bank, which will uh, allow children or students to access the content. Accessing it has to be in a mobile format. So it's an indirect way of applying mobile learning by building this resource. And it only was launched uh, 9th of January. So it's, it's a very young experiment. But we are also working on the pedagogy and on preparing our teachers to benefit from this resource. So we are working with Imagine Education on uh, preparing our teachers. We call that project Teachers First. It uses actually the UNESCO competency framework for teachers. We are working with Discovery, Discovery Education to train our uh, science and math teachers to use the Knowledge Bank in delivering their classes. So now we are thinking of flipped classrooms and other things around this new creation we call the, the Knowledge Bank. And it's a very exciting experience. I guess what is even more exciting is when we wait six months and assess this experiment and see what happened, what we need to change, uh, listen to people's experience, but without even changing the infrastructure or doing anything, we are getting millions of hits from children, first graders and up. Uh, so it's one way of doing mobile learning without pushing it through. It, it was done through creating an incentive, like having this huge resource which is accessible to the entire population and it's getting a lot of um, positive response from everywhere. So um, this is exciting and now building on that we are trying to have a blank sheet of paper and rethink education from the ground up. And that's an exercise that we are starting this week, actually, in Egypt. So it's, it's going to be fun, I guess, to watch this exper experience. That sounds like a, a massive undertaking and uh, a, a really exciting develop, development, coming at things really from quite different uh, direction. I think. Uh, can I go to Ashok in India uh, for uh, yeah, hi. your comments on um, comments taking the discussion forward? Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, taking me in. You know, it's very, very interesting, and I might give you some statistics which might uh, surprise uh, uh, most of the people taking part in. You know, in India, uh, we have got more than 800 million people who use mobile phones. And uh, the irony is that none of the schools in India, which is again uh, more than 1.5 million schools, uh, we don't allow mobile phones in our schools uh, because more than seeing any advantage that it might offer, uh, what we are scared of is that it might bring in a lot of disciplinary issues. So this is one contradiction. Uh, the another uh, thing is that only a few days ago, the government of India unveiled uh, a major policy which suggests that uh, almost 160 million households uh, who have no access to digital technology and uh, their um, inclusion in the economic growth, their own and the country is directly linked with digital literacy. And uh, the government has planned that in the next five years, at least 60 million households will be made digitally literate. Now, I see that only mobile phones uh, will be the platform to bring in that kind of digital literacy in these uh, 60 million houses. So how we are going to do it? But having said that, let me tell you, uh, the technology, um, induction and its integration in our schools is rising, uh, but it is certainly not mobile technology. It is uh, uh, the interactive boards in the classroom. It is uh, uh, the internet connections in the classrooms. Uh, it, is, uh, it is tablets to some extent. It is uh, the laptops and the desktops which are available to the children, uh, but it is very, very limited and it is in less than uh, Twenty percent of the schools in the country it is uh, at a massive use, uh, but more than fifty percent of the schools uh, it is not being used at all. 
and the reason for that is not that we do not want technology to come, but the reason is uh, uh, that of the bandwidth, that of uh, sometimes even the electricity, uh, which is just not available, and therefore we are facing huge problem. Uh, but we are uh, conscious of it, we are aware of it, and we think it is a challenge uh, that we have to overcome sooner than later. I, so I'd like to bring Alexa in to talk about some of your experiences uh, and of the use of mobile and different ways in which it's uh, adding to education. I can think of a few European interesting stories as well as many others. Sure, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Gavin. I think you know we where we carefully design our approaches and use of, of technology and, and mobile technology in education more specifically then we can see that we can have positive outcomes in terms of student achievement and motivation and engagement in the learning process. And I think some of the examples which have been successful are where we split that cost burden between the state and parents, for instance. I think one of the, the biggest examples that we've had in Europe over the years has been in Portugal with the Magellan project where we had um, of course, notebooks rather than smartphones, but they were a shared burden between the telecom providers, the Ministry of Education, and then parents themselves contributing to those costs. So it became more sustainable within the system to be able to go out and bridge that equity gap and make sure that many different students could actually get access to a device and could also have um, connectivity in the home. I think what was also interesting in that specific case that I'd like to bring up as we think about what kind of devices we, we choose is that we talk a lot about smartphones in the context of, of mobile learning and I mean we're all glued to our smartphones and, and don't escape them but I think something that we must bear in mind is are we making the right pedagogical choices about which kind of device we put in the hands of students? And as we see now, ex increasing convergence in the costs of smartphones versus tablets, for instance, I think there's much more space to explore that, whether it's more relevant to have a tablet, to have a much more powerful and larger device, which enables students to have more screen real estate to interact with their learning content, to be able to use multiple apps simultaneously, and to also have an active stylus, which encourages, encourages them not just to type, but also to write and come up with problem solving and some of those memory type of activities that we know are so important about using a pen um, compared to just use, using a keyboard. And I'm seeing some interesting projects now, for instance, in South Africa, um, in Gauteng, um, they're starting to go for these types of devices where you have um, you have a physical keyboard that you can add onto your tablet, but you can combine it with the pen so that you get that really flexible learning experience, which makes it much more richer for students. Um, but at the same time, um, put in place the appropriate types of security so that even in rural or poor contexts, we're not seeing theft of those devices, which is a big challenge in a lot of those kind of um, constrained circumstances. So I think there's a lot of those pedagogical design principles we need to embed into our technology choices to make sure that these kinds of programs are a success. Thank you. That's really helpful. I think there's a lot, and I'd, I'd almost uh, uh, go back to what Mike said right at the beginning. This uh, it's the uh, it's about getting the ped pedagogy right. Uh, like all innovative developments, uh, you can you can stand or fall by getting your strategy right in the first place. Uh, and it makes me think of, uh, and I, I go back, Mark, to some of the, the initial documents that were, set, uh, were produced by UNESCO on the use of mobile tech and would point everyone to have a look at those because I think there's a lot that is still relevant. Uh, things that have been reinforced for me, for example, by the, uh, the European project, the iTech project, uh, and one of the critical things there in the use of technology was that when you um, when students started to take on board the management of their own education by having access to the data that they needed to in order to be able to do that management of education you change the relationship with the student you get a, a far greater sense of responsibility and ownership and when you get that agency by students then you get much more positive uh, many more positive things happening and uh, frankly the use of mobile technology, whether it be the very simple 
uh, mobile phones that Mike was talking about in Bangladesh, uh, enabling students to get access to, or the more complicated things which allow them to gather data and to uh, message and control what they're doing, uh, all the way through that spectrum. I think there are tremendously positive things. If we simply try and do what we've been doing before, it's a mistake. But if we start using the real opportunity that there is for that greater, if you like, democratisation of the way that things work, then I think we're in positive. Mark, do you want do you agree? I, I agree completely. Um, I think to Tarek's point, with, when we did our scan of different policies related to mobile learning, what we found across the world was just a flat blanket ban on mobile technologies and education, as their speaker from India said. It's still not at all uncommon to see them just outright banned. And we're talking about the correct pedagogy, getting the pedagogy right. And uh, one practice that we've observed is uh, some schools have allowed uh, students to use mobile technologies when they take assessments. And suddenly that can really kind of move uh, the line in terms of pedagogy, because suddenly you're opening the door to what was once considered cheating, but is in fact in a digitally connected world is not really cheating at all. And that almost forces changes to pedagogical approaches. Um, so I think that's a sort of interesting way to, you know, we can talk and talk about moving pedagogy, but I think until we change assessment, uh, pedagogy is unlikely to, to change radically. Thank you, Mark. Um, Steve Oslo, I, I know you have a question, and I'm just coming to that. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to go to Jim Knight, I, who I know is dying to speak there in Austin. So, Steve, from South Africa, since we've just mentioned it, what's your question, and have you a contribution particularly to make? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks very much, Kevin. My, my, my question was um, to, to Tarek. Um, just to, around the, um, the access to the, to the Egyptian knowledge base. And um, if I understood correctly, he was saying that access is limited to mobile devices. Now, I, I was interested in the, the thinking behind that, um, because I, I, I would have thought that, you know, we, we should allow any type of device to, to connect with a Euro on a, on a laptop or on a you know, tablet or on a phone. Um, so that, that, that was my question. It sounds like a really interesting resource. I'd love to find out more about it. Um, in terms of my comment, I just wanted to say that um, in South Africa, some of the projects that, that we've been running, we've, we've actually used, um, this is now kind of at the end of primary school, beginning of second uh, of high school, we've used some of the students or learners, as we call them, in the class to become um, e-champions. And that's just the name we, we came up with. But instead of this, this dynamic, um, and uh, the, the, there was talk earlier about this power, you know, this power difference. But often, I think we all know that um, with mobile learning, there, there is, or to any technology, there is a power dynamic between the teacher and, and the students. And often the students are more tech savvy than the teacher. And so by introducing e-champions, we, we said, well, these students are there to help the teachers and almost provide first line support. Um, and to help introduce mobile learning into the classroom just by, just by getting their fellow students online, um, getting them to connect, helping them. And that's been really powerful um, for, for the teachers and for the learners. And given, uh, you know, as Mark was saying this, uh, or somebody was saying this, there's a real sense of agency to the learners. And I think in that kind of context, it hasn't bothered the learners that, um, the education space is kind of co-opting their space and their technology. We, we've been really surprised by how these, these students have really kind of jumped to the opportunity. And in fact, they had to apply to become champions and make quite a rigorous, um, quite, quite, quite a rigorous uh, kind of criteria and, and judging process. And it's a real honor, you know, to, to, to be part of that. So I just wanted to add that in, that it's just a, a, a novel way of, of bringing learners and teachers into the same space. Thanks, Steve. Um, I um, I think we should go straight back to Tarek and see. Uh, can you can you answer Steve's question? 
Well, if I uh, understood correctly, uh, I, I think, no, there is a misunderstanding. The, uh, the Knowledge Bank in Egypt is a digital library accessible to every Egyptian citizen. That's, there are 90, 90 million of them from any uh, device with an IP in the country. So this could be a desktop, a laptop, um, tablet, uh, mobile, all kinds of computers, any, any device that accesses the internet from any IP within the country. But it's open to all and there are no limitations on licenses. So the beauty of it is access to all, no restrictions, as long as you have this criteria, accessing it from Egypt. That's it. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. And Jim, just, um, I know you're dying to jump in too, so why don't you go? Uh, thank you, Wayne, which I'm Jim, sorry. Which, oh, oh. Jim. I, can you toss <laughs> a coin, please? Yeah. I'll let you, I, I'll I knew I'd run into trouble as I said. Jim, you Good go night. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm happy to go in whatever order, but I'll, I'll go if you like. Really what I want to do is just share a little bit of experience from the UK and from uh, TES.com, where you know, in the UK, like others have said, we have this huge nervousness around the use of mobiles in classrooms for behavioural reasons, which you know, personally I feel is a waste of an extraordinary resource as long as it's not uh, exacerbating inequities, as, as we heard earlier on from, um, from Thomas in California. Um, but I thought that uh, Alexa's uh, comment around pedagogic choice and device choice is really interesting. Um, at TES, we have a big, we're a big publisher of news content. We are a big sharing platform for uh, teacher content as teaching resources, and then we have a big jobs platform and it's very interesting when we look at what the different devices that are used across those three buckets of content if you like and around 90 percent of our news content is consumed on mobile uh, so that tells us whatever the worries culturally we may have about the use of mobiles in classrooms there's no doubt that teachers uh, certainly in the UK are heavily using mobile to browse news content about education and then we see similar not quite as high but similarly now that we've made our jobs uh, platform more mobile friendly we're, we're also seeing teachers browsing for jobs quite heavily uh, using their phones um, you know on the way to work or whatever um, they do then find that there's a problem if they're interested in uh, a job in a particular school that they then try and look at that school's website and find that it's not mobile friendly and you know, there, I think there are some issues there for schools in thinking about um, the use of different devices for different functions but in resources it is less so now some of that may be a problem with our site but I think that goes to Alexa's comment about different sorts of uses and different sorts of pedagogy so um, browsing content consuming content I think uh, is much more comfortable and normal for us to do using mobiles. But once we get into significant creation, uh, then it's harder. We all know it's harder from partly because of real estate, partly because touch screens can be just more clunky. Um, and uh, yeah, the technology, the devices may make that easier. And we now see with things like the Surface, um, uh, some uh, devices that, that offer both, and Alexa talks about some of those. Um, but uh, certainly my experience looking at our data that we, we generate at work around different uses of devices for different content, um, uh, there's some real thought that needs to go into that in terms of the pedagogy. Thank you, Jim, number one. Um, <laughs> the I just I, there's something really important I think all, all about all of that and it, it comes back to Mike's point right at the beginning I think which was uh, or one of the points I, if I picked it up correctly which is just that um, recognizing the technology you've got and designing the pedagogies uh, or design the pedagogies first and then using the technologies you have and that's a that's an interesting prospect I think particularly where um, not everybody has the same mobile phone. If we're coming away from the, or, or the same mobile technology, if we're coming away from this idea of technology being 
provided by the school, then we have to think about that very, very carefully. Now, Jim number two, if I may go to you, and Jim Wynn, please. Hi, Gavin. Thanks for that. I've just been following yeah. Twitter, and um, and I have to say the volume of tweets is probably the highest in all of our EFF so far. It's just the world's gone mad. However, an awful lot of people are tweeting what I would call negative thoughts. What about equity? What about bullying? What about when the novelty factor wears off? What about privacy? What about... And it's really interesting that people aren't tweeting about the potential positive gains. And I think that there's two things. I want to pick up what Mike said earlier. You know, I, Mike, I hope I've got this right. But he said something like, well, just get on with it. Just get on with it. And Hive, Hive said, you better all wake up because um, the students are getting on with it anyway. And I think that those are important messages. But I think what's missing, a lot of people have said things about, we've got to get the pedagogy right. But no one's saying what that pedagogy is. So I think that the Twitter sphere is looking for some things to try and things to do that are very practical. You know, like you know, uh, Tarek here was saying, we can make content available and have the pedagogy for the teachers tuned into that availability. Um, Tim Unwin tweeted, you know, we could actually use the device, as other people have said, for assessment, but start to assess the amount of innovation that's going on in class. Uh, rather than assessing other things. So can I just make an appeal that we might actually start to hear some, not just only positive things, but things that work so that the Twitter sphere can go away and try something tomorrow. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and good advice. I need to also go to the, uh, the Twitter feed shortly with Ken. But uh, the order of things coming up, by the way, we're going to go to um, John in a second. Then we're going to go to Amini in... Uh, Dubai. We're going to Haif in Amman. We're going to Alexander, I presume in Moscow, um, Wu Yi in Beijing, and then we're going to come to Sean back here in Paris. So in that quick round the world trip shortly, uh, I'm sure there'll be some more comments that come in between. But John. Can I, can I just make a very simple point, 15-20 um, seconds at most. Uh, there have been a few comments already around how we need to get the pedagogy right. If we get the pedagogy right, then the technology will work. I, I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I think there's a, a dialectic between technology and pedagogy. Sometimes it's pedagogy first, technology second. Sometimes it's the other way around. Because certain technologies bring affordances, they bring capabilities that actually change the pedagogy and change what you can do and what you can't do in the classroom. And we have to keep that in mind when we're, we're, we're dealing particularly with mobile technology. Absolutely. Simple point. A good, good practical point. Um, Amini in Dubai. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this very impressive discussion. I really enjoy it. I just want to add uh, two points. Besides pedagogical approaches and learning design for mobile devices, we need to add uh, to, to, to consider two other point, two uh, more points. Uh, number one, to consider to talk about uh, e-content design, content design for mobile devices, and the standards of content design that should be for mobile devices. Considering that we have um, very limited screen size, we have also uh, very limited navigation. So, uh, what should be done and how for bite-sized content and micro learning as well? So also the second point I, I want to consider the user uh, experience and user uh, usability standards. Um, when, when we design for mobile devices, we should consider that uh, there are certain standards should be considered for uh, design for usability and accessibility, of course. Uh, also, I, um, I would like to share uh, our experience at Hamdan bin Muhammad, the smart university uh, for mobile learning and using flipped learning as well, how we design learning, uh, flipped learning for mobile devices, as we uh, already uh, 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 designed the content and based on 
uh, certain learning scenario and pedagogical uh, uh, scenario and pedagogical approach for mobile devices we recorded already uh, uh, short videos as micro learning and post all on mobile for our learners and uh, uh, our faculty members give just in time uh, teaching and support uh, based on what already resources post, uh, post uh, for them through the mobile devices uh, that is uh, all sort of ac uh, accessible on their devices anytime, anywhere, and we provide just-in-time teaching for flipped learning. This is for Dr. Tare uh, Shawi. Uh, uh, I'm very impressed of uh, your experience in Egypt. Thank you, Dr. Tare Shawi. And we we are here in Dubai in uh, HBMSU. We have good uh, experience in flipped learning. We can give help in this. And thank you for uh, giving me the, the time to, con to give my comment and my contribution. Thank you very much. Shukran, Amani. Shukran. And a quick, uh, quick word to Sean. So I, I wanted to um, address that point. From a device side and from an application side, developers really need to focus upon creating applications that support different types of device types and different operating systems. So if we really want to promote this idea of personalization from the student's perspective, it gives the student the ability to move from the smartphone, to move from the tablet, and then to potentially move into, into a laptop, which may or may not have certain features. But developers, if they are going to be successful and if this environment is going to flourish, ultimately, they need to support this idea that it's about ubiquitous access in, ter in terms of the device and there shouldn't be this emphasis and focus of, and dependency upon what is the, the specific and correct device. Uh, absolutely. And I, I can't help but uh, I, add to that because uh, the United States, the EdTech Developer's oh. Guide, and just but just the bit that I really liked within that was innovate, don't digitize. That's right. And so there's, I kind of, that just keeps coming back to me as absolutely, uh, yeah. uh, absolutely the right. correct sort of advice. Hyphen Jordan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I've been trying to, uh, I'm very much in, uh, enjoying the uh, debate that's going on. And uh, I have a few thoughts that probably are not very uh, organized and in fact quite disruptive. To start with, as Jim mentioned, um, I released a, a frustrated tweet that we're still debating whether technology uh, does add innovation and does actually uh, improve education. And in fact, uh, students and children are using it whether we like it or not. So we either hop on board and know how to adapt this technology to help the students uh, improve their learning or otherwise they're just going to use it uh, for play and for just access and uh, social media. Uh, another point that I wanted to raise, I think we spend a lot of time trying to focus on the cost of technology, finding cheaper solutions, uh, how usable it is, how, how functional it is, whether it adds innovation or not. But I think there are also other aspects that I don't think enough debate or enough work is being done on. Because really integrating technology in a ubiquitous way, the way, the way uh, my colleagues have been talking about, requires a little bit more of a, the way I would say it, more of an ecosystem. So to start off with, there is an attitude about technology, be it in schools, be it in teachers, be it at policy level, be it at parents level, that really uh, don't see technology as as mainstream education and and uh, i was reading through the concept note and there was some discussions about um, that technology enables uh, uh, um, lifelong learning and enables uh, uh, self-paced learning many people around the world like i talk about our part of the world the kids are not used to the, to that and i think there is that chip that we need that needs to to be placed in our heads to be able to look at technology uh, uh, this way. The second thing is that uh, and uh, we are, at our part of the world at least, and I think many parts of the world, you will find that governments uh, don't have the right set of policies and strategies that really push 
for effective utilization of technology. Uh, simply, it's not mainstreamed. Uh, they buy books and they write curriculum, but somehow uh, you'll find that even in national strategies at country levels, uh, people are not viewing technology uh, as mainstream as a main enabler to increase access, to, uh, to, uh, to innovate in education, uh, to provide uh, more exposure uh, to the students. And I think there has to be a debate around that. And how can we uh, um, maybe edge governments to, to start looking at that? Because the, the, we could continue exploring technologies and their effectiveness, but without putting the right policies and procedures to integrate them, uh, they will not be uh, uh, put in place. Um, a third point is that uh, I, I believe pedagogy and, and teachers' capabilities comes first. Uh, and again, I go back to it's an ecosystem. So if you don't have teacher who is capable, who knows and understands how to use technology, uh, no technology in the world will be used in the classroom. So you, we really need to learn how to prepare our uh, our teachers uh, in jordan here we're launching uh, uh, the first probably teacher preparation program before uh, they enter the profession uh, at the queen Lani teacher academy and that's going to be probably one of its kind in the region and my colleague nermin and i from ji we're, we're discussing that we're going to be preparing teachers uh, uh, in a state-of-the-art fashion to use technology, but what, when they, what happens when they go into schools? Are the schools going to be enabled? Will they have technology? And will, the, uh, will those teachers be allowed uh, to have that access? Final comment, um, I think all what we need to do, sometimes we overcomplicate matters. All what we need to do is look at exemplar models where technology has been used in a very simple way, being integrated into people's lives. For example, in Jordan here, I can mention some of the private schools, like the school where my kids are. Technology is not a big issue, and they don't study all the time using technology, but they have mobile devices, they have their own laptops, they have assignments, they communicate with the teachers, they manage their work. Just the way I go to work and I manage using technology, I communicate. My kids manage their learning with their teachers through technology, and that is a very simple, straightforward ma uh, matter, but I know it adds a lot to them. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I have to admit, I lost count of your points there, Haif. I'm sure you said more than three points. With uh, <laughs> Your numbering system is, was very effective, though. Um, no, but thank you. Lot, lot, lots of good, good things. I think, I, I mean, particularly I take from that uh, or something about setting the context in which things can happen. I, I come back to my comment earlier, innovate, don't digitize. There's a real danger that if we just simply try to magnify education as it is through technology, what we get is not the best world, not the best difference. And so that um, I, I agree with you entirely, how we can move that th things in that way. I, just so people know where things are going with this, I'm going to go to Alexander in a moment, then Wu Yi in Beijing, then Andrew Grayley, then Ken, and then Mike Sharples. I've not forgotten you, Mike. It's just trying to do things in order. So first, Alexander Yuvarov. Uh, hello, Kevin. I Hiya. hope you can hear me. We yes. can. And I like very much uh, what uh, I say because it is a very good name for our discussion. We are talking about quality, and I would like to say that now we are talking about technology, not as about technology, but as about quality edu education. Uh, for many years, quality was after the technology, and I would like to say, if you will say quality and technology, it's even better, because we have found that if you would like to reach real high quality for every uh, student, you will have to use technology very much, a lot of. But to do that, you have to restructurize the education process. Uh, we now use the word uh, chronotop, chronos and space, time and space, because a chronotop 
of educational process now is changing and we have to rebuild uh, the whole school process uh, with new chronotope when students can use technology everywhere when they can learn anytime and they can learn in any places so that is the most uh, interesting point uh, for me right now because when we see these changes in our educational uh, system in schools we really can see the new quality and from my point of view it's extremely important but we immediately have a new problem uh, we need teachers who are not just know a lot of about their own subjects but teachers who can teach who can support in different way and from my point of view uh, it is one of the main problems for educational transformation for new quality of education and in Moscow State Pedagogical Institution uh, we are uh, trying to develop now new approaches how to train new teachers how to restructurize the whole educational process in the college so they will come to school with new way of teaching and what is wonderful we have a number of school where principals where the administrators are waiting for them thank you thank you alexander that's uh, that's brilliant sounds like a very uh, exciting development development in a, a, a number of ways not least uh, when the when the system is waiting for these people to arrive or when the principals are waiting that's uh, that's really good uh, so spasiba to you uh, now i uh, wu yi in beijing hi hi good good morning everyone so uh, I'm really happy today because, uh, yeah, it's morning in Beijing, 2 a.m. So, uh, so I'm happy so far. So, uh, some of us has discussed the role of teachers in the in the in the IT uh, teaching uh, century. I think I will basically introduce uh, what our uh, school has done so far. So around two years ago, our school has uh, implemented the iPad teaching so that every student has an account so, uh, on, the, on the internet in which he, he or she can check the assignment and the uh, teaching materials given by the teachers and do whatever she likes, like uh, do the homework and assignment and then finish the quiz online. So I would just uh, talk something about the consequences that follows up. I think the first consequence that all the teachers like me pressure now because in the past, uh, in the classroom, we only have books and the uh, PPT at most. But now we have and we have iPads. Every student has has iPads so that we have to a lot of to handle. So it asks for a lot of skills, add skills for teachers. A second consequence that uh, if students, they have finished their quiz, their assignment online, so teachers must to know how to under, how to look into the data, how to interpret the data. So for math, me for statistics, uh, it's just okay. But for some teacher in some other uh, subjects, it's not easy to interpret data to understand the things behind the data. And the the third consequence is that as some as I mentioned, because the students might abuse the uh, mobile tablet or mobile so some countries uh, mobile uh, mobiles and phones are banned right in china it's case by case so in, in our school students uh, are very likely to abuse or overuse their tablet their mobile phone in and out out of the classroom so teachers have to and the school leaders have have to cope with this issue and so all this things requires a, a more, so teachers have more uh, skills. And so we have to give teacher more trainings. Yeah, so in China's context, 
uh, China is very complex and the vast countries. We have big city, modern city, Beijing and Shanghai, but we have quite poor uh, cities and uh, even towns, the west part of the, this country. So our school is trying to be a bridge that we are trying to, now we're trying to ass assign agreement with other uh, good universities in, in UK and US so that our school could be could be served the uh, the training centers in to bring teachers in China. So when teachers in China they want to get training, they don't have to go to US, don't have to go to UK. They can just come to our school. And especially, I think that one of the key issues in this training would be how to cope with the the e teaching and the iPad teaching. So that's pretty much what I want to say. So the I, the, the issues questions. I, I, I want to give that how can it's the same as the issues the the Jordan gentleman the Russian the Russian gentleman has mentioned that how can we better prepare uh, prepare teachers and prepare the school leaders in our school to to cope with the challenges and to to lead the IT IT transformations in our schools. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wu Yi. I think that's. Uh... I, I feel that we could have a whole nother debate on uh, on the teachers. Never mind a debate, actually. Debates are fine, but it would be lovely to move from debate to action, uh, come up with real ideas that we can implement. Uh, just so people are aware, the, the, the current uh, running list is Andrew Grayley, then Ken uh, Royal from uh, New York, Mike Sharples, Nermeen from Jordan, then Mariana, then Thomas. Uh, and then we'll come back. There, there, is, there are more, uh, but just as Twitter is becoming very uh, busy, so are the number of people who want to speak. So, uh, Andrew, if we can keep things reasonably brief and as crisp as you can, that's brilliant. So, Andrew. Absolutely, Gavin. You, you know I can talk for England and most of Europe, so I'll, I'll be brief. This is a great example of how what we're seeing today, uh, mobile technology has been a great leveler. It provides a level of uh, equitability of access to uh, technology, to, to teaching and to learning. And you know, to a certain extent, that's what Polycom is about, is bringing people together regardless of whatever device they've got access to. And I'd like to share a few experiences I've had over the last six years since I've been at Polycom with how this technology really has an effect uh, and can help deliver teaching into organizations. Um, uh, we, we've got s some examples. I heard um, Haif and Jordan, and uh, I think Alexander as well, were talking about how you're turning out or we should st just start use this technology. It's already in use and how you're turning out teachers that are, are ready and technology friendly and yet when they arrive at the classroom that uh, they might not have the infrastructure around them. I think it's a very important point to make sure that not just to introduce new technology but also to make it sustainable. And one example we've got, which has been running for quite some time now, is uh, VUC Storstrom in Denmark. They run a, uh, an adult education course uh, on many topics uh, for Danish young adults that left school without qualification. So it's not just inside school, it's also outside school and the continued learning and development that this offers to those students. And they set up what they call a parallel classroom, sorry, the, the global classroom, which is part of parallel teaching. And they adopted technology because they didn't have enough teachers to cover all of the locations that they needed to send to uh, um, these courses. So they, they'd have one teacher, teaching two classrooms of uh, identical technology at each location. And it might not be rocket science, it might not be unusual to those on this call, but you know, to an adult, that, a young adult that left school without qualifications, it, it also meant that they got that access, they got that course, they went through that training quickly. Um, and as a result, they've produced now a program called PITEX, P-I-T-E-X which is about the actual pedagogical training itself and how to prepare a teacher to be able to use this kind of technology. Now, it's, um, it's a really good course that 
it's as a result of some PhD research. They've got a wonderful PhD student over there, uh, Charlotte Wheats, and she's looked at the whole scope of the interaction between student and teacher, um, what's left, uh, or rather, uh, what, what happens in that interaction, and is anything left out, is anything missed, but also how to plan ahead. And they found that there's a change in attitude from standing at the front of the class just spouting out knowledge into actually being enveloped in a session and being able to share that knowledge and have full interaction, and then the follow-up to that as well. So I think there's, uh, there's some excellent examples already in play. Storstrom have been running for nearly eight years, I believe, like this already. So it is sustainable with support from the government and from the ministries, um, but also it's about making sure that those teachers are supported once they're in class and once they're in the school and they can take that forward. I could carry on, but I'm going to hand it back to you, Gavin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Jim, would, Jim, would, when could you switch off your microphone, please? I can hear you typing. I can't quite tell what you're typing, but I can yeah. hear it. Um, it wasn't. It, it, it was. It was switched off, Gavin. So it must be some other culprit. Well, you're either. You must be hitting the uh, keys very hard. I think. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, Ken, Ken Royal, um, can you give us some feedback from? Have there been any tweets at all? Well, there's been plenty of tweets, Gavin. Uh, you were you were trending uh, in the first few minutes of this debate, and uh, I've noticed that uh, you know just becoming a, a whirlwind of of uh, of people trying to get into the conversation. Um, you know, Jim Jim Wynn brought up the uh, um, the information about a lot of the tweets were involving uh, pedagogy and they and they were uh, um, many many of the tweets tweets do involve pedagogy and getting that right in order to get this right um, a lot of people are um, think that just using technology it doesn't mean that they know how to use it for learning and so that's that's important which brings me to something that I see coming up on many many of our our debates and that is as experienced teachers uh, who taught her, a teacher who taught herself to use mo mobile uh, pedagogy, mobile technology, um, I worry about teacher training. New teachers, are they ready? And a peer uh, learning, can that be worked into this as well? Um, having teachers know more about how to teach with this, how to learn with this, so they can show students how to learn with these, th these new devices as well. Uh, there's a great many um, that just say, let's just get on with it. Uh, <laughs> enough of the, the conversation, let's just get on with it and do it, and it'll take over, uh, which I thought w you know, was interesting. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, this one was interesting to me, Odette Swift. Uh, fantastic results um, using donated smartphones in South Africa for sign language curriculum. You know, we, we, we don't we don't go beyond just thinking about uh, the average everyday classroom. We need to look into more of you know, those students who can benefit from this that we sometimes overlook, I think she's saying. Um, can we please speak about the pre and in-service teacher training? This comes up, this is coming up a lot. I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, and I, I love this, uh, there's, there, are, there are a few people online that could be a conversation unto themselves. Uh, um, Purna Kumar Shretha, I hope I pronounce his name right. How can we ensure that the inequity in education isn't perpetuated <coughs> by this use of mobile technology? Um, there's a principal in New Delhi, India. He points out that uh, Indian students are frightened of the behavior problems or the, or the ban of mobile, mobile devices. It, it just brings back to the point that the world is a complete a connection with all of this because you could be talking about a school in the states when you talk about this. Um, what, do we ban these things or do we use these things? How do we use these things better? I think that's important. I'm gonna, and uh, Mark Robinson, who is always involved in, in mobile devices, says, um, looking at mobile devices versus full computers, deep productivity tool or mobile knowledge access supplement strategy should lead choice of device 
Uh, I can go on and on. There's more. It's gone through. You could write a book on this again, Gavin, but I want to give it back to you because there's so many people that need to say things. I, I'm sure you will, Ken, write that book. Um, <laughs> but thank you for that summary uh, from New York. Uh, I, I think there's, there's lots there that's picking up. Uh, so I'd like to say uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, putting all these tweets out there. That will form part of the, if you like, the, the knowledge that we gain and that will all be collected together. And I think I, I'm trying to just double check as we speak. Um, we, are, I think, are having a webinar that will follow on from this. So this is not the end of the conversation. It's not even the beginning of the conversation. It's just a staging post in the middle. So we're taking things for, forward from here. I think, um, uh, just on your point, or whoever said it, let's get on with it. Please do. I think the, I think that it is happening. It's happening despite us. We are not controlling it, and that's the wonderful thing of it. It's maybe frightening to some people, but I think it is actually part of the wonderful thing. People are using these mobile technologies, and if I may go back just for a moment to the UNESCO documentation from some time ago. One of my favorite examples from that documentation was uh, a teacher who many years ago now, um, who, who in order to deal with the worries that the Indian uh, principal mentioned of uh, the people being out of control, he had the students of the school uh, develop the policy for the school. And by engaging them in developing the policy for the school in that way, they then policed, policed is too strong a word, but they then ensured that the policy worked. And so it's, it, these, there are, if you look to what has been done by people starting off in this area, uh, there are solutions to a lot of these things if we look and if we look at where there is good information. And I commend those research documents that were done some years ago now. Uh, but if you look up, I I'm sure you'll tell us how to search for them mm -hmm. and find them. Um, with that, sorry, for speaking so long. Mike Sharples is next. Thank you. I'm so pleased that the focus of the discussion has been around the pedagogy and as well the interaction between the pedagogy and the technology. Uh, and I would add one more interaction, which is context as well, that the context in which the learning takes place is also equally important as we've seen from the many different cultures and backgrounds of the people who've contributed. But I'm going to take up the challenge of what's the pedagogy related to mobile learning. And I'm going to give you four examples very quickly, um, very different ones. First one, spaced repetition. So if you want to learn a language, um, then vocabulary learning is an important aspect of that. And we've known for nearly a hundred years that you need to be able to space that learning. And there are plenty of techniques now for um, retrieval and um, using the power of retrieval and spaced retrieval for learning. And mobile devices are absolutely perfect for spacing out um, that retrieval practice. I'm just reading a book at the moment, this one called Make It Stick, um, The Science of Successful Learning that's all about um, the power of retrieval for learning and at appropriate times. So that's the first thing, timed retrieval for learning. Second one, small group learning. So there's been some fascinating work by Miguel Nussbaum and colleagues in Chile, which has been looking at how you can enable small group learning in classrooms. And he's found that if you learn a concept or if you practice a concept on your own first or try to solve a problem on your own, then you discuss it with other people around the table and then you share it to the whole class. Then that's a very effective way of working. The problem is it's hard to coordinate that uh, using pencil and paper or traditional media. And he's worked out a way of mobile supported collaborative working where that coordination is done by the mobile devices. It's a very compelling and effective way of supporting small group collaborative learning with inside the classroom. He's used it with secondary school students, he's used it with trainee teachers. So that's the second one. Third one, mobiles as science learning toolkits. Now every mobile device now, every smartphone, has got around 15 to 20 sensors in it. Uh, 
as well as cameras, um, voice recorders. Each mobile device is a science toolkit and we should be exploiting that um, for doing science learning both within and outside the classroom. And the last one is mobiles for data collection. Uh, so, for example, we had a project called Healthy Eating where children collected um, visual records, food diaries of their eating over a number of days on their mobile devices and then shared that back in the classroom. Um, all of those are examples of where you really can't do it without a mobile device. Uh, and so we've got good exemplars now of mobile pedagogies that are successful. Uh, what we've got to do now is spread that best practice more widely. Uh, and I think that's the challenge now, not to uh, say you know, what sorts of pedagogies might be appropriate, but to take the best practices and spread them more widely. Thanks for that, Mike. That's, that's, that's really useful. Uh, the, the, the only one I would discuss with you are, uh, is uh, uh, probably an art toolkit too. Um, but the combination of arts Absolutely. and science, I always think, and that balance, it's one of the, my favourite false dichotomies. I think we need both. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, anyway. Yes, and there's some great art toolkits as well. Absolutely. So now, Nermeen from Jordan. If you are still there. She was, she was. Yes, of course I'm there. Hello. Excellent. Thanks. Go ahead. Well, uh, I've been uh, wonderfully enjoying the conversation taking place. And uh, as you just mentioned, it can take uh, ages to, to keep on talking about technology and education. Um, uh, well, my point uh, from why how I see things is um, devices is very, are very important, but um, I would be rather more interested in terms of what kind of content that the kids will have access to through the mobile devices, be it the smartphone or the uh, laptop or a tablet uh, for that matter. I mean, uh, language of the current time uh, and language of the children is technology and we've got to speak their language. So we've got to combine education with technology and uh, we need not be overprotective, in my opinion, about what would we be exposing our children at in the education system, because whatever they don't have access to at schools, they'll definitely have access to outside the schools. So having them bought in in a policy is an example that I really loved, because together they will make sure that at their schools, they're going to make good use of technology and would not be deprived from the devices and the way they would prefer uh, to learn. I mean, um, in, in Jordan context, nowadays we have a big issue of the Syrian refugees and huge numbers of uh, informal education kids that are left out of schools as well as formal education classrooms that are packed with children. Uh, technology, in my opinion, from the experience where we pilot content and prepare the um, infrastructure along with the teacher training for integration technology in a pedagogy uh, manner at schools, I can assure you that technology integration helps in a management of a packed classroom rather than uh, uh, distract the kids. And hence, I find it um, a manner that actually can help in management of classrooms, engaging the kids, and at the same time, availing technology uh, to kids in terms of connect, connecting to each other, individualized learning. The, the, the re challenges remain in the connectivity and sometimes in like this discussion, what would be the best device is it one too many? Is it the mobile? Is it the tablet or others? Well, um, from our observation in Jordan, the mere usage of mobiles in classrooms for education for students might be a bit premature. Well, someone had mentioned the point of having the environment ready for the integration of technology and the kind of devices to be used, and that's definitely correct. Um, I don't see that the parents in Jordan would fancy and actually um, uh, 
sort of see the, the perceive the use of mobile with a student as an educational tool. So a blended learning approach with um, simple uh, devices and uh, in terms of tablets or for that matter a computer, uh, multi-computers available with few in classroom technology with accessibility to technology um, uh, might work in the current local context uh, yet, it might not be the case for the Syrian refugees. Um, statistics in Jordan had proved that Syrian refugees uh, of a younger age might have access in formal education, informal education, to devices like mobiles more than Jordanian school uh, students in the formal education schools due to the uh, um, uh, lots of um, donations and programs that are done within the camps for informal education. So in my opinion, I, I don't think that um, things should be um, so, uh, sort of complicated in terms of what kind of devices to be used rather than availing the right content on an open source manner. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, uh, that content to be uh, engaging, enriching to the curricula, getting out of the box in a textbooks that are imposed by the ministries of education in our part of the world, having it tackle only the desired outcomes with an enriching material available on a portal that is available to students from classroom and homes that would include the enriching material to that outcomes uh, aspired by the ministries of education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noreen. I, I'm, ver I'm very glad you brought up the uh, education in challenging circumstances or education in emergencies as it's sometimes co uh, called. That's been a, a key focus of many conversations in international uh, contexts that, that certainly I've been aware of in recent times and I think putting our minds collectively to how mobile might be used. Uh, it, it may not be the, the final way of doing things but as a bridge to where we wish to get to. Uh, we shouldn't kind of deny use in that kind of context, I believe. Anyway, uh, just so people know where we are, we're going to Mariana next, then to Thomas. Uh, I, and I apologise, it's taking a little while to get round to people, but that's because everybody's keen to contribute. Feng Chun Miao is going to come, then we'll go to Vidushi, I think, in India, and then Zohra. So, um, Mariana. Uh, yes, Gavin, thank you very much. I'm really enjoying this discussion, this conversation, and I think that uh, this collective, ex you know, very good experiences should, ha uh, should prompt UNESCO as an intergovernmental organization to really uh, produce the compelling evidence for ministries of education of how mobile learning can work and can improve uh, education quality. Now, the topic of our uh, discussion is innovation and quality, two sides of the same coin. It seems to, from what I'm hearing, is seems to be the case that there is a link between innovation and quality, but however, I doubt that educational systems are, around the world are prepared for that. That is, innovation is very much uh, regarded as a, you know, a, a moving target, a, um, we, we know that technology changes very quickly. Uh, ministries of education very often, particularly in developing countries, fall into this trap of let's buy the latest laptops, mobile devices, without really thinking through uh, what the needs are, how teachers are, you know, uh, prepared, how teachers, in, in fact, what teachers think about all this uh, new technology, how students uh, react, we will react. So we've seen Thailand, that was, you know, a uh, less uh, successful initiative in one tablet per child. We would like to maximize the good uses of mobile learning, not to minimize them. So building a culture of innovation is very much a collective effort and I, I would like to come back to what Alexa was saying earlier that this is very much a multi-stakeholder thing. I mean no teacher, no matter how brilliant she or he may be, will produce innovations throughout you know a school 
or you know two or three um, th good very uh, you know very good tech savvy teachers will produce innovations innovation is very much about openness about uh, collaboration about interdisciplinary learning uh, this culture of collaboration I think it's what we should compel uh, ministries and you know people who are less who are skeptical about the uses of mobile learning that it may work secondly OECD produced a very good uh, report uh, two years back measuring innovation in education uh, what they said clearly there is that ed education is at or below the level of you know speed of innovation <laughs> but higher education is the field that takes over primary and secondary education in terms of speed of innovation and it's no accident that MOOCs m m these massive open online courses have uh, you know emerged on the higher education uh, landscape and what UNESCO would like now to proceed to beyond the hype uh, you know of MOOCs they are there we have this tall order of uh, toward inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all by 2030. I think that there is great potential for online learning in higher education and flexible learning in higher education to really widen access to quality education. And we are now studying how, higher, uh, how MOOCs can be used to provide, for example, digital credentials for Syrian, the same refugees and migrants uh, but let's also think of student mobility in higher education. It's, you know, it's, it's on the rise. It's all over. Uh, Norway now, I was just reading yesterday, they are, uh, they are now the government implementing a new quality teaching agenda, like the teaching excellence in, in UK. But thinking of, you know, internationalization uh, phenomena, Norwegian students going abroad, but also students uh, uh, coming uh, uh, to Norway. So all these things, uh, and let's also, last but not least, quote Malaysian government who introduced, you know, MOOCs for first and second year students with the prospect that, you know, the examination will lead to, cr to credits that will be transferable. So the world is moving, the students are moving, and I think that mobile learning, although there is not yet clear and, you know, evidence of how it can maximize education quality and innovation is there and it, it presents great benefits and potentials for uh, for education thank you mariana i think that's right and it, it makes me think of just one thing as we as we go through um or two things i'm going to say one one is um innovation involves failure right uh, it, and it, it, it's just actually how you get that's how you get those two are you really innovating if you don't fail uh, and actually, how can we make failure part of education? And I don't mean failure as a really negative thing. I mean it as a really positive thing. If we don't take we risks, learn. we don't chance, take chances. And if you go to an earlier one of our discussions, which was uh, one of the education fast forward discussions, which was all about brain science. And if there is certainty about what you do, brain science tells us you find it far harder to learn. If there is uncertainty because of innovation or perhaps because of innovation you can do much better now I'm, I'm I apologize for this we are we could probably spend 24 hours doing this uh, uh, but we're not going to um, I, unless I fail completely <laughs> um, so can people please try and be as crisp as possible as we go into this last 20 20 minutes or so so uh, Thomas is next and then thank you Thomas Hello. Um, yeah, it's been really delightful hearing everyone's comments. I just wanted to really briefly touch on this question of pedagogy and the preparation of teachers. That's been uh, that's uh, that's been a thread. And to emphasize, I, I enter this work as a former teacher and someone who's a current teacher educator. But I think part of the challenge here is that our our view of teacher preparation is somewhat limited, where we where we're focused oftentimes on training teachers for particular technologies as opposed to really engaging with a fundamental shift with which teachers start to see mobile technologies and technologies more generally as a resource, right? One resource in a, in a large repertoire of re, uh, resources that they use. Um, there was a, a piece that a colleague and I 
um, wrote in the Harvard Educational Review in 2013, and part of what we proposed there is how do we start to think about the text, the tools, and the talk that mobile technologies make available. So when we think about text, um, mobile, mobile technologies are, are, are incredible in terms of allowing for personally relevant data, such as um, like uh, healthy eating that Mike had mentioned earlier on, or um, gathering information about people's neighborhoods and bringing that into the classroom, or um, the access to, to global inf information instantaneously, uh, social networking that allows for different types of uh, con conversations that's, that happens, but also the, the text that it, it brings. In, in terms of tools, also mobile technologies allows us to analyze data on the spot in incredible ways that we haven't seen before. And in terms of talk, we see asynchronous talk. We see uh, talk across the globe as we're engaging in right now. So there's these immense uh, affordances of mobile technologies. And I think part of what we need to reshape our, our, our emphasis on pedagogy is how teachers start to see the affordances of mobile technologies in terms of text, tools, and talk that they can then incorporate into their classrooms in really profound ways that respects their professionalism, but then also the, con uh, the local context. Um, and, and just the last part of it is when, uh, like going off of the comment of <coughs> let's get on with it, I really believe we, we need to. I really also believe that uh, young people are using technologies in ways that uh, we're way behind the curve in education. However, I also just want to put the caution that we need to do it in a manner that really deepens learning. Because if we don't, if we don't deeply think about these challenges and we just get on with it, then we tend to reproduce the structures that exist. And I think it needs we need to really think about the affordances and limitations of technology if we're going to if we're going to innovate and innovate in ways that broadens participation. I absolutely agree. I think that that fundamental of innovation is critical. Feng Chun, Feng Chun, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I, <laughs> I would like to uh, to continue, if possible, to skew up for the discussion on the teacher's rule and. Uh, the pedagogy led use of mobile technology. In UNESCO, we used to talk about using mobile technology to empower teacher. Now it seems that we should talk about how to prepare and support teacher to empower the use of mobile technology uh, in school settings. And uh, uh, to, uh, to this thread, uh, uh, our thinking is that first of all, we would like to update UNESCO's ICT uh, CFT, uh, which is the ICT competency framework for teachers and try to integrate uh, the um, uh, impact uh, uh, of mobile technology and uh, mobile learning in the education settings. Because when we develop this uh, framework, we didn't think of the potential of uh, mobile technology. Now it's quite timely for us to think uh, what kind of teachers we should prepare for the schools. It's not difficult for us if we examine the teacher's attitude and ability to mobile technology. We can easily uh, categorize teachers to a mobile blind teacher, a mobile sensitive teacher, mobile responsive teacher, and a mobile uh, transformative teacher. So our purpose is that in the teacher's standard, we should uh, integrate the use of uh, mobile technology into the qualification for teachers and to prepare through the pre-service teacher and in-service teacher training institutions uh, to get them ready to use uh, the mobile technology and to design the pedagogical principle of using mobile technology uh, in uh, instruction and also student uh, learning activities. And when we come, uh, come back to the, to the theme about the relationship between pedagogy and mobile technology, I would like to put forth uh, uh, again uh, something like the categories. Uh, somebody, especially some expert, have been talking about uh, uh, the relationship between uh, learning and uh, technology. They call the, uh, the current technology, especially the internet, a kind of uh, transactive uh, memory uh, partnership. Partner, which means we take the internet as a partner, uh, we can uh, store the Im information there. We don't need to memorize all the information, but we simply search information and then we use the information. Actually, uh, developing uh, to today, I think if we look around the examples we share today, uh, we can propose that. Uh, the mobile technology have, have become a kind of uh, uh, transactive problem-solving partner, which means it's not only a, 
uh, kind of partner to help us in the memorization. It's really helping us to solve the problem. If we take uh, mobile technology, especially mobile phone and tablets, as a kind of partner, it's a 24 hour partner that we can always rely on, we can always work with. It's not only to search information through the mobile technology, but also to use the, uh, the mobile technology to solve the problem that may be assigned by the teacher, maybe uh, you know, faced by the individual. I think uh, it become a kind of a transactive problem solving partner. And um, uh, if we bring the social clue, the social perspective to the learning, we can also take the mobile technology as a kind of a transactive uh, socialization partner. It's a 24 hour arm partner for the children, for students and for adults. They can use this uh, media to socialize with anybody in the world and we can, uh, you know, if teacher open uh, their mind, their mindset uh, to the potential of mobile technology uh, based on this kind of uh, thinking, I think it's very easy for us to prepare the teacher uh, to, uh, you know, transform the pedagogy instead of bring the mobile technology back to the traditional or existing pedagogical activity. And uh, at the same time, we are also talking about supporting teachers to use uh, mobile technology in fact too. For this purpose, uh, the proposal or conclusion, uh, especially I can draw from this uh, debate, is very clear. We need to redefine the curriculum and assessment and even the school settings first, which means before we redefine teachers' rules. We cannot ask a teacher to do that and that uh, without any uh, change in the curriculum assessment and the school uh, settings. So that's my uh, takeaway from this debate. A very thorough takeaway, I would say. Uh, Vatushi in, uh, uh, in Delhi. Are you there? Or Karam, are, are you there? Well, it's very late in Delhi now, so I'm, I am sorry, that, I'm sorry that we missed them. So, uh, on then to Sura. Thank you, Gavin. So, uh, I would like to share a couple of uh, views from a technology perspective and uh, to continue on the point raised by Sean earlier. Uh, from our uh, perspective and experience as a technology telecom provider, um, we see that limited inter interoperability of the different platforms for education is today a bit of a challenge and a limiter to spread the access and use of the technology and the availability of um, and the available digital educational resources and tools. Um, uh, technology providers may want to consider looking into a form of standardization or more particularly interoperability of the um, uh, education platforms um, uh, so that the complexity of the technology is moved away from content providers, teachers, students, and that access to educational content is device and platform agnostic. Um, in other words, how can we better co uh, cooperate and uh, provide an interoperability and uh, standardization that would allow for a greater diversity uh, to access quality content in an easier manner? Um, another point is that uh, while there seems to be a consensus, of, uh, as you can hear around the table today and uh, on the web, that the use of technology for education has the potential to drastically improve access to quality education, um, it needs to be provided in a safe and secure way, uh, and end users need to be adequately informed and introduced to it. Um, in many of our projects, we target relatively marginalized areas and communities where the technology is first introduced through our projects. Um, what we see is that the real world is being reproduced in the virtual world uh, with all its richness, but also a certain, to a certain extent its dangerous and bad behaviors. So preparing the students <coughs> and the teachers to the use of the technology in a safe and responsible manner is probably crucial here. To be sure. no, thank you very much indeed for that. Very good summary. Um, so now to live, I think. Are you there? Hi. Yes, Excellent. I am. Can you hear me? Oh, I can. All the way from somewhere else in Paris, I think. <laughs> so uh, please thank go ahead. You for having. Thank you. Uh, I'm joining here from um, from Oslo, uh, working in the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation and representing the Norwegian government uh, in this conversation. Um, I think there are two points I would like to, to mention uh, as a comment to, to all of the great um, questions that have been raised on Twitter and also the different presentations we've heard. Um, one is um, 
I would like to touch on on uh, the opportunity to try new approaches, particularly for reaching uh, children affected by crisis and conflict, where I think there is a real scope for trying new approaches, just because the situation is so dire and, uh, and, uh, and the perfect uh, opportunities are not possible. Um, and uh, so we are working on a project now to try to reach out to school Syrian children on their smartphones with learning supplements for basic literacy in Arabic. And, um, but I think in order to succeed with such an approach where you're aiming a learning tool directly at the household level where there's not really any, how should I say it, supply factor being the teacher in the classroom. You really, really need to be even more user centric and, and really think about uh, the ped ped uh, pedagogy and how you can try to build the technology and, and the, the content on the user behavior and user patterns that users already have. So just to, to give an example, we went to uh, Gaziantep in Turkey on the Syrian border and had lots of household uh, discussions and focus group meeting with, meetings with Syrian refugees living there. And one of the things we found is that a lot of the children are actually playing games on their parents' smartphones. They're playing entertainment games just for fun because, you know, the parents want them to, to have, at times have something to do and, and just to... to relax and, and enjoy themselves just like my kids do in Norway. And at the same time, these parents are keenly, keenly interested in their children learning to read and particularly learning to read in Arabic, being the, the, the language they use at home. And also it's important for them in the event that they may return to Syria. So it's just, you know, all these discussions around the context. So I fully agree on the need to, to look into the context and also to look into uh, the user patterns and, and to see how you can tap into that. So, so we are trying to, in, in the project that I'm coordinating, a lot of international partners, uh, we are trying to uh, engage, for instance, then the entertainment gaming uh, companies more, but not on their own, but as part of teams uh, on, on how you can try to have more engaging tools that can actually be more than demand driven because you really need to tap into a demand for something. So, um, so that was one point I would like to make. So just the need for, for also thinking about engagement as an entry point for quality, because if you can't engage the learner, then you know the, they won't be using that learning opportunity if it's made directly for them. Um, and then my last point, I try to be brief, is that I really also think that there is a scope for trying to link the education sector um, with other sectors, because I think particularly when you look at lifelong learning, and, and really the potential for, to reach more people with fact-based information and to really tap into a new cultural learning, which is being built around ICTs. And I think UNESCO made that point in the position paper for the uh, SDGs, that ICT and particularly the mobile phone has this potential to really drive a new cultural learning in many areas. And we see that because people want to use mobile services. They want to, to use mobile payment solutions. They want to use SMS. They want to be able to stay in touch with friends and relatives and use services. So I think the education sector can play a tremendously important role in building digital literacy, reading literacy, and, and just the skills needed to take advantage. And I think the schools also need to have to have a crucial role in, in building digital skills. So I agree with the point that we really, really need to just, you know, get on with it because technology is uh, a parasite for, for uh, the modern economy, for, for getting good jobs. So I think you need to learn these skills. So that was Thank just you, a comment oh. from Norway. Thank you. And I apologize. I, I was uh, misinformed. I thought, I thought you were in Paris somewhere, but uh, Norway's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, now, Steve, I, you've, I can only allow you a very short time. Steve Oslo, I think you had one last comment uh, because we're heading rapidly towards the end. Steve. Thanks, Kevin. 
Damn, I, I, I had a couple of things to say, so I'm going to just strip it back and let me let me pick up the the one. Um, well, the first is actually two very quick ones. It was good of Mariana to kind of bring us back to the, the topic, which is innovation. And um, the great thing is that often mobile is is has been taken up at such an exceptional level in developing countries where resources are scarce. And we know that scarce resources are often a driver for innovation. And so I really see the two going hand in hand that in the right context, um, the innovation that our technology, which is mobile, can be used in deeply innovative ways in teaching and learning in contexts that didn't have these opportunities um, before. I just want to make very, one very quick comment, getting back to the professional development that support for teachers. We've actually found in many projects in South Africa, working with the government, that we actually had to have on-site facilitators for three or six months at schools working with teachers. Um, so we've trained teachers on the pedagogy of teaching with technology, but even that is not, not, not always enough. And in, in, in these maybe extreme cases, I hope not, um, I don't think so. I think it's. I think we don't. We, we underestimate that for many teachers, it's a seismic shift in the way that they teach to start adopting mobile learning. And you sometimes have to have an online facilitator there for three to six months, working with those, um, working with those teachers, until they see the real benefits of using technology in a way that benefits them as teachers and benefits their their learners. Um, but I, I I think this is a point that. I'm really happy to hear we all agree on that professional development and teacher support is crucial to the success of mobile learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And and just with that, and I apologize, you were breaking up a little bit there, Steve. We should recognize that um, there were uh, one or two contributions here which have suffered a little bit from uh, from connections, and uh, that's just the connectivity in, in the particular areas. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment, but at this stage, I really want to go to Jim Knight. Uh, I'll just make sure I get the right Jim this time. Uh, Jim Knight to draw some conclusions and uh, concluding comments and then pass back to me for a, a final round of thank yous. Jim. Uh, thanks very much, Gavin, and uh, it's been a really wonderful conversation, uh, obviously beautifully facilitated uh, by yourself um, around the world. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of things, and I can't I can't deal with all of them, but you know, from um, Mike and Thomas starting out, to some extent talking about different contexts and place, and how there is there's a range, and, and we need to be um, cognizant of that. To then live towards the end, there talking essentially about you know the refugee challenge and pop up schooling, and uh, and and really a point that you made, I think, Gavin, about you know we need to use what technology is there, and then. Um, then can we drive pop-up content to go with that in those sorts of emergency environments? But there's been a, then this constant theme around teacher preparation and ongoing teacher development and how we deal with that. And that, I think that last point from South Africa from Steve around you know, rec thinking about the pedagogic spectrum and, and where people are on and, and how we adapt and, and think about our solutions according to where the teachers are. And, and it might need quite a significant uh, human investment to deal with that. There are issues of, of inclusion, issues of types of content. You know, I'm interested in how we reduce teacher workloads. Uh, one of the big workload challenges in my country is around marking. Now, this mobile technology, by feeding uh, content uh, anytime, any place, can also deal with peer feedback, and we can build peer marking, which um, could be a huge time saver as well as uh, embedding learning as well. So we, we can think more creatively about that. I loved the comment um, that was slipped in about use it in assessment, because uh, that's in the end what will drive it. That's what will uh, make it happen, because uh, teachers all worry about uh, assessment, and I agree with that. Um, but that some governments are grabbing hold of this. I'm very impressed here in the US with how the uh, federal government here are pushing the use of OERs um, and uh, trying to reduce the addiction that the school system has to textbooks, which I think is a, is a part of this. We haven't really talked about the bad behaviours, and to some extent that's the elephant in the room, because if we're really going to get governments and teachers to properly adopt this, then we do need to share best practice around how we deal with poor behaviours associated 
uh, with mobiles. But finally, I would say, Gavin, um, we do need the innovation. We need the risk taking and uh, maybe you'll be able to do a some more beautiful facilitation of a failure fest here on Education Fast Forward uh, where we can uh, share uh, all of our failures in trying to do all of this in the most positive way. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I, I think a failure fest is a very, we, we had a little discussion about this the other day and uh, failure fest, just by the way, if you want to know how to do one of those, the big thing is uh, you, you get five minutes presentation about your failures. The important things, there are just three rules. First rule is you don't blame anybody else. It's about what you got wrong. The second rule is you do it with humour. Uh, because actually, uh, frankly, if you do those two things, what you get is a, 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 pop, a, a lovely dose of empathy because we all have failed at some time or other and being honest and open about it is a great thing to do. And the final thing is that you reflect upon what, you, uh, what you've learned from that process. Uh, and that's really where I came uh, while I was talking about the risk taking at schools and allowing failure because we can learn so much from doing that and we can test out new ideas and do uh, I, I think do more uh, so that's why I'm not in favor of failure <laughs> but actually when it happens there's an awful lot we can take from it um, I think I, I, I want to just very very quickly and this is one minute Ken Royal it, just a comment on the tweets and what's going on? Is there anything that you would say finally? Yeah, you know, it, it, what's, what's interesting, Gavin, is I've, I've had to tweet back to some people who I really felt badly about not uh, sharing some of their comments because they were absolutely wonderful. But what's interesting is that the involvement this time in this conversation has been unbelievably overwhelming. And uh, I think that what's happening is is that um, uh, the Twitter sphere, as we as we knew it, uh, where we only get a few people in conversation and giving suggestions, um, jumped all over this. And uh, I have to say this: that uh, Jim mentioning um, the negative side of things, which we tend to do, um, started people jumping in with positive suggestions that were real suggestions the reality of um, what it would be like in a classroom or more specifically in learning places and that is a big comment out there with a lot of people we we need to talk about learning places rather than talking about you know in a classroom because most of the world doesn't get into a classroom that's brilliant thank you Ken that's a that's thank, an excellent way to you. end there I have, uh, what can I just say um, Number one, uh, watch out on EFFdebate.org for webinar details. There will be a, a follow-up webinar which is picking up on the strands of this conversation. Number two, thank you all for participating. So uh, this is all about participating, taking part in the whole thing. So your contributions, whether by tweet or by conversation, whether from a video conferencing centre or in whatever way you've managed to do it, thank you. I think bringing us all together and getting us to work together and share uh, uh, share the ideas and making a community of us is absolutely critical to the success that we might have. I'd like also to thank Polycom for uh, a great job in supporting us, giving us the technology through which we could make this happen. UNESCO for partnering with uh, us at Education Fast Forward uh, to make this work and I think uh, the, if Twitter is an evidence base I think uh, there has been something successful happen today to Yorktel who have also helped uh, organize through the technology to Bermethian who have supported and still support um, education fast forward and also to Nesta the National Endowment for Science Technology and the Arts in the UK which is uh, works very much on innovation and which also supports us we appreciate all that help but uh, Frankly, without all the contributions and all the participations, it would be nothing. So I hope you take from this uh, a lot of encouragement that there are a lot of people like you who are trying to make this move ahead. And um, without wishing to uh, mention any sports manufacturers or anything like that, uh, just do it. <laughs> There's so much we can do and 
uh, where you can with courage go forward uh, take the risk and do it so thank you very much and with that we bring the debate to an end